This is Robert Capuccio. Welcome to the Self Help Antidote, a weekly dose of reason, perspective, and insight, where we challenge conventional thinking and explore authentic strategies and insights around personal transformation. Our commitment to you is to bring you some of the world's leading experts in the domains of fitness, wellness, coaching, and behavior change, separating fact from fallacy. Hello, Tiffany Cook. How's it going today? Bobby Capuccio, you look strapping today. This is the best I've ever looked. Feels like 1992 when you used to make landline calls and there wasn't any option to see a face. Is that what it feels like, really? Because, I mean, you're staring at my avatar, which is a bald gray man, which is not too dissimilar for me in real life, actually. I'm not staring at an avatar. I'm staring at the word iPhone without an E on the end. So iPhone. iPhone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's nothing like 1992 because no. we didn't have iPhones back then. Technology needs a growth mindset today. <laughs> it's like iPhone was like when you were trying to describe something about your phone, your landline, but you were very drunk. So it just came out that way. <laughs> Other than that, like the, the iPhones hadn't even been invented yet, unless you were, but never mind. I don't even know where I'm going with this. But anyway, so this week, reading mindset from the master of mindset herself, Carol Dweck. Mm-hmm. And this is, this is one of these books. I'm reading it now for the second time. I read mindset years ago. And there, there's a couple of misconceptions that she addresses in the book that have always frustrated me because when you read the research from Carol Dweck, a lot of her research was based on children and what type of reinforcement is constructive versus what other type of reinforcement is well-meaning, but it can be detrimental to their self-esteem. It could have the exact opposite effect for some very interesting reasons. And it could be deleterious to their level of performance in the long run. And it deals with, mutability. Like, are my attributes fixed or are they mutable? Can I change? Am I someone who's capable of changing based on the feedback that I get from my efforts in the world? And I think that's quintessentially what we're talking about when we talk about growth mindset versus fixed mindset. But people kind of quoted growth mindset to be whatever they thought was important. If they, if they thought something in life was important, They coined it, well, that's that's a growth mindset. And it's like, wait a minute. If you go back to the research, that's really not. And and what I missed the first time around is within one of the later chapters towards the end of the book, she talks about major misconceptions around growth mindset. Can you see me right now, Bobby? Yes. For those of you who cannot see Tiffany. See, Tiffany, I can see you. What are you doing? Are you getting addressed? Speaking of change. I hope you have something under there. (laughs) Oh. Tiffany's okay. So Tiffany's doing a, a wardrobe change right now. We'll get back to Carol Dweck, but you were talking about change, and at that moment, I was kind of trying to just to change out of my hoodie, but I've got wired headphones on, so now I've got my arms out of my hoodie, and I'm stuck. <laughs> so yeah, it kind of looks it like off my head with my headphones on. I'm gonna have to slide out for a second. <laughs> Speaking of being. Drunk. Not like I would know what this is like, but you know, like some other people when they explain, like in the past, they would come home really intoxicated and Mm -hmm. midway trying to change out of their clothes, they'd (laughs) find themselves in a conundrum and all tangled up. That's what this reminds me of. (laughs) Well, I'm free now. I'm free now. And I'm, I just got really hot. So I'm ready back. I'm back ready to to discuss. (laughs) I can't even say the word growth mindset with Carol Dweck. That it book is, is sitting, I haven't read it for a lot of years. It's one of the very early uh, books that I bought around the kind of mindset. I was trying not to use that word because it's the title of the book, but when it came, mm. when my interest in the mind and our mindset and whether or not we have the ability to enhance it or change it, that was one of the first books I bought. So that was yonks ago. Probably didn't even look, if I'm honest, don't even know if I read much of it. Hmm. Well, in her, in her words, Carol Dweck says, a growth mindset is about believing people can develop their abilities. It's that simple. If you're going to break down what a growth mindset is, that's it. 
and a fixed mindset. And this is interesting because obviously people don't have this overt fixed mindset Mm -hmm. or sometimes they do. Sometimes people don't believe that people can develop their abilities. You're either born with something. You could, of course, develop your talents, but if you don't really have a talent in that area, you're not cut out for it. You can and, and I kind of do think that's true to a certain degree. I think everybody could develop their abilities in any area, but some people just have natural proclivities to some areas that other people don't. So mm-hmm. everybody's like, oh, well, you know, if, if you would just be willing to work just as hard as Michael Jordan, you know, you can perform as well as Michael Jordan. I think, well, yeah, Michael Jordan needs, needed to work extremely hard to become Michael Jordan. Evidence of this is the story, you know, it's a pretty famous story where he was cut from his junior varsity basketball team. Mm. And people are like, oh, God, wow. How'd you like to be that coach? What an idiot. It's like, no, the coach was not an idiot because first thing, he didn't cut Michael Jordan from the junior varsity basketball team. He cut a kid named Michael Jordan, Mm. but not the Michael Jordan that we know today Mm. because Michael Jordan wasn't Michael Jordan yet. And had he not been cut from his junior varsity basketball team, he might not have had the impetus and the internal drive to become Michael Jordan. But he was he was a version of him, but he wasn't NBA Michael Jordan. He would have scored like a thousand points in one game if he was the the version of Michael Jordan we all now know. And, and that coach probably cut him based on what he saw. So we know that he had a transformation that was probably an extremely steep uphill climb. But if Woody Allen took up basketball when he was younger, would he have with the same work ethic with the same amount of hours he's putting in, would he have become a Michael Jordan? Probably not. Mm. I reckon the growth versus fixed mindset for me, when I think of my experience perceiving whether or not I had a growth mindset when it was, when I, mine was more fixed, it was more about if I wouldn't push back on anyone else's opinion of my abilities. So if someone else, anyone, if someone else was like, you have talent or you do not have talent, then it was kind of that was the end of the road. It was like, oh, okay. Like someone else was in charge of deciding whether or not I should pursue something. And if they, if someone told mm-hmm. me that maybe that I didn't have it, then I probably would just go, okay, I don't have it. I'll go do something else. Whereas now yeah, I realise yeah. that other people's opinions don't really drive anything. They don't, but that's easier said than done. And especially as a child, if you hear that, and that's absolutely a fixed mindset. I mean, people get offended when they even think that you're suggesting that they might have a fixed mindset. But getting offended at the fact that you might have a fixed mindset is in itself a fixed mindset because we're a combination of both a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. And some people lean more towards one versus the other in different aspects of their life. But if you're a kid and you grew up hearing that or not even hearing that. Here's how it comes out in insidious ways. So let's say your parents, right, are people who are hypothetically well-meaning and they want to reinforce everything you do, but they start to praise outcomes, which is very dangerous and disruptive for a child's ability. So all you ever hear them say is, wow, oh my God, you're so smart. Oh my God, you're so talented. Oh, wow, you're just you're just such a gifted person. Well, they're not praising or reinforcing anything that could be be behaviorally worked on, if you know what I mean. They're praising things that are immutable. And, and then if you grow up with parents that would be like, oh yeah, that kid next door, Jimmy, what an idiot. That kid's just an outright idiot. And you're listening to them make determinations about, immutable attributes that other people have because they're a gossip. And a lot of times people do grow up in in, in these environments. Well, you're indirectly learning from your parents that some people have certain traits and, and sometimes those traits are not desirable. They're not flattering. And that's just the way it is. That's just who people are. Well, if we grow up and our survival and our sense of safety is based on pleasing our parents, 
we unwillingly take on that mindset without even realizing it. So we encounter someone who says, well, you don't have it. And we've been conditioned both directly and indirectly to believe that. Well, it makes sense that our fixed mindset would leave us taking someone's assessment at face value. Mm. Then I wonder how much of it just comes in, like how much people pleasing just comes into that. So what's actually, so how much of say in my, in my experience, my interpretation of that was just driven by, I'll do something if someone else says it's worthwhile. So I'm not even doing it for me. Well, that's the other end of that, isn't it? Right. So you know, ac- accepting someone's appraisal, that's a, th- that can be attributed to fixed mindset. I was going to say with boxing, n- no one said I was good at it. I just, I just decided to keep doing it and I felt crap at it, but for some reason I just kept doing it. But I know, and I'm not just, this is not just imposter syndrome. I know that in the training for my first fight, that's first 12 week challenge. I'd never fought before, jumped into a 12 week challenge. I know my trainers thought about of, of much as much of my ability as I did, which was pretty terrible. I was like, this is kind of embarrassing. I'm going to be hopeless. I know that they thought the same. And when I, we finally got to sparring and they saw me spar, they were surprised at my response and uh, not that I was great, but they were surprised at how I went for the very first time sparring. Um, so that's weird, isn't it? Cause I went, Oh, I'm not, this is the first thing I'm not good at that. I'm just going to keep doing anyway. It's, you know, it's not weird because you stumbled upon something that you were committed to for your own intrinsic reasons, which is one of the re- reasons why I get so frustrated, especially when it comes from so-called educators or, or self-help gurus that label people. Well, people are this. You know, people are strong. People are, we're we're all a combination of all that. The irony is if you're someone who is an educator and people believe in what you have to say, so they hold you in high esteem and you're like, oh, well, people are basically lazy or people are this. You're perpetuating indirectly the same fixed mindset that stops your audience or or doesn't stop them, but creates a barrier to learning. Mm. So if, if, if you're one of these self-help gurus that says that learning is quintessentially the key to or the lock on any aspect of your life, but then you're labeling people and going, there are two types of people in the world. That's the epitome of a fixed mindset. Mm-hmm. So you're saying one thing, but you're indirectly sending another message. You become the actual barrier to your own students, especially with the people who are like, yes, right on. I believe that. Because now they're verbally affirming something that's rooted in a fixed mindset. So it's almost like people who bang on about how entitled people are. That's an entitlement. That's an entitlement-based mindset. If I'm constantly focused on who's entitled, well, that's, a, that's an internal conversation. Very often it makes it out into an external conversation around who's more deserving. And I'm usually in the more deserving group. Rather than let me let me cultivate the attributes that I'm most proud of, that most align with my goals, most align with what's most meaningful to me, and not worry about like how much I deserve in comparison with someone else, because that entitled person that you're targeting, the constant targeting of that hypothetical person is a conversation around entitlement in and of itself. So it's very hypocritical. Mm. So I, I get I get really frustrated with those labels because it, it it blocks our access to a true growth mindset, which deals with reflection, reflection, understanding, and strategies to move forward. What does it take? Like the, that the whole thing that I've talked about with you know I want to become a neurosurgeon, and you enroll in school and like just work for it, just grind but there's never instruction. There's never neuroanatomy. They don't even teach me on a cadaver how to make a proper incision. They're just like, well, you just got to work harder than anyone else. And it's like, oh, well, yeah, thanks. Now I'm grinding and I have a lot of confidence. Like if you would have brought me a year ago ahead 
and a knife, I would have said, no, 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 I'm not doing that. But now give me a head, give me a knife. I'll just hack into that thing with like <laughs> relentless intensity. Doesn't make any sense, does it? <laughs> if you went to the, I don't know, the Ted Bundy school of neurosurgery, maybe that would be kind of, that's <laughs> actually very, <laughs> oh. I don't even like making that joke as I'm making it. Oh God. Anyway. So yeah, that, that that's kind of my problem with the, the, this labeling of people. It's a mis, it's a misconception, and it comes right out of Carol Dweck's mouth when she identifies three very common but damaging misinterpretations. Mm. Yesterday, I was I started doing a solo episode, and it kind of kind of was on this topic funnily enough because I was talking about and I and I stopped halfway through and I turfed it for now because I just got I just felt like you know when you you start to talk about something and then you realize all these other contexts around it and then it just turns into this big massive thing where I'm like oh shit hang on I don't know if that's all going to get lost in translation like you, there's not enough clarity around the different contexts and the idea was because I was Looking at people who start something, let's let's say a business, just for argument's sake, start a business, um, and like you said, just keep grinding, just don't give up. Right, the the people who succeed in life, absolutely, like I wholeheartedly believe, they're just the ones that don't give up. But it's not the only attribute, because I looked at, I, I stumbled mm-hmm. across someone who's been in business for a while doing a particular thing, and I've watched them over the years ebb and flow and you know, try different angles with it. And I looked at their the stuff that they were doing and the messages they were dropping and they were just, there was no engagement and there was, and I was just like, this is, you're still from the, and again, context, the, I'm only looking for the context of their social media and the engagement of what they're putting out and how it's being received. And I'm like, there was zero engagement, yet they're just grinding relentlessly, putting it out all of the time. And I was like, at what point is that the neurosurgeon that's not? So how do you get feedback? Mm -hmm. How do you grow? How do you know when being tenacious and just not just doing the thing is the improvement in itself or when you're just, slamming your head against a brick wall and not actually not evolving throughout the process, not learning, not growing. And that's part of the mental acuity that Carol Dweck talks about as well. Mm. It's, it's being able to, and, and often with the help of other people, and I'm not saying that everybody who wants to do anything needs to go out and hire a coach. I realize some people have greater levels of access than other people. But somebody who can kind of give you feedback or assessing, okay, what exact, it, it, it's almost like you're, you're putting two posts out in social media and I'm not very engaged in social media, so probably not a social media expert, but if you're going to post something on one platform and the same exact post on another, but each one has a different headline, what's the response you're looking for? and testing which headline gets the right response. And once you get a headline with a better response, okay, we'll now use that one and then test something else against that. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're just being really clear about what am I looking for? What is the outcome that I want? And, and it may not be an outcome out there. It might be an intrinsic feeling like I'm, I'm contributing, I'm engaged, you know, I'm connecting with people in meaningful ways, but whatever, it is an outcome whether it's mm. intrinsic or external, and, and how do I know what does good look like? Because it, it, it's almost like when I first started working out and I, I got my certification when I was 18 years old, I got my first fitness certification. And I went to you know a friend of mine, I was talking to him, and he was an IFBB pro bodybuilder. And we got on the conversation of form. I said to him, well, what exactly is good form? And he looked at me like I forgot to pay my brain bill that month. And he's like, you just got certified. You don't know what good form is. He's like, you gotta, you gotta go slow and use control. And I remember having quite an issue with that because I was like, okay, so 
let's say I'm doing a bench press, hypothetically. Mm. As long as I'm going slow and I have control, Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how I move that load from point A to point B. So there's no... There, there's no focus on dynamic stability, static stabilization, the path of motion I'm using, the range of motion I'm using based on my goals, my needs, my wants, my abilities. As long as I'm going super slow in the gym, I'm doing it right. So basically, I could smoke a bunch of weed, go to the gym, I'm all good. <laughs> that doesn't make a lot of sense to me where I was like, okay, well, what exactly does that mean? What does good look like exactly in terms of execution and mechanics? Because if I know what good looks like, I could start to recognize deviations from that. Mm. So I'm not looking for perfect, but I kind of need a conceptual ideal to contrast my results off of. And that's kind of the same thing that we're talking about. What does good look like? What does not good look like? When you get a result that you weren't anticipating, you're not happy with, how do you modify that approach? And of course, not quitting is, is a necessity. If I quit at something, well, you know, I'm, <laughs> if, I'm in a, if I'm in a basketball game, going back to you know, Michael Jordan, and I quit in the middle of the match, I'm not going to score any points, obviously. But there's so many other elements to success. Mm-hmm. So I went with my with my wife to a screening yesterday and this film, it was the person's first film. It got made. It has a, first of all, it is an amazing film, but it's this individual's first film and it's already highly acclaimed and she's already famous. And, And there, there are filmmakers that are very good and they're so talented and they've been like, talk about grind in that industry for 15 years and they're nowhere near close. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, it's all about the work you put in. I guarantee you as hard as she worked, and I'm sure she worked her ass off. She didn't work harder than a lot of other filmmakers who it's, it's not their first film. It's their 12th film and they're nowhere even close. So there are other variables. And when you dismiss them, you might get a primal emotional response from somebody because you're playing into their anxieties, their resentments, their frustrations. But you're also not examining a lot of other things that if you were to examine them and understand them might help you. If not succeed to a greater degree faster, frame how you deal with disappointment because you understand the dynamic complexity of the endeavor. So I, I just really take issue with a lot of people that call themselves quote unquote coaches and they give these oversimplified bottom line responses. Cause I, I don't think they're, I don't think they're helpful. Yeah. And I think context is everything. Yeah. I think everything, I don't think there's a, a an industry or a, any sort of technician in the world in any area, whether it's PT, whether it's brain surgeon, whether it's business person, whether it's salesperson, that it comes down to uh, interpersonal skills. It comes down to engaging personalities, um, communicating clearly and emotional connection, right? Because you can have the most, you can have the most, amazing idea and amazing product with absolute technical brilliance. But if you can't market, communicate, appeal to people, make them feel good in the process, you know, that's why some filmmakers might make some technically amazing, but if you can't package everything up and create something around you that engages people, it's that it's, so we've got to get our blinkers off. Well, I think that interpersonal dynamic in 99.9% of industries is critical because your success depends on how you influence other people. Yeah. Period. Yes. And yep. nothing's more frustrating than seeing someone you consider a lot dumber than you doing much better than you. Mm. I don't, and, um, and, and I don't think I, I'm not saying that like there are people who are dumber than you, but everybody's smarter than somebody in some area. 
But we see that a lot in the fitness industry. Or I, I remember when I was in the fitness industry, there would be trainers of like 12 certifications. They're brilliant. They can tell you if there's a dysfunction in the dorsiflexion or the first MPT joint, like what the probable serial distortion patterns will be all the way up to the cervical spine. And they had two clients where all the trainers would come to the gym and not really know anything or even worse, the stuff they knew wasn't accurate. And they'd have a full book of clients because they just knew how to connect with people. Mm, yep. I was having this conversation with somebody in the legal services recently in a business meeting, and we were discussing areas in our business that we wanted to do problem solve or just improve on. And this topic came up and it, it was funny because we, we have completely different areas of business. So it's weird to be talking to a, you know, a, a lawyer essentially about law <laughs> when you're someone who punches people in the face and talks on microphones about shit. <laughs> but De- I, Denny Crane. we we were taught I was giving them I guess this outside perspective on the user experience of a lawyer and what's the first question Bobby that anyone asks um, a lawyer when they want to engage them what's the first number one thing that seems to be a priority what do I do if I'm arrested <laughs> <laughs> well anyone but you most people the number one thing is, well, what's this going to cost me? Lawyers are expensive. What's this going to cost? So that's the number one thing. That's what I want to know. When I, I want a lawyer, fucking how much are you going to charge me? Right? So lawyers know that that's a, that's a big pain point. But when, so I remember ne- needing some advice once on something and I asked, I approached a lawyer who I knew and I said, all right, I need this help. And, and I knew it was going to cost me because lawyers are expensive. But they got on the phone and we had this phone call. And my emotions went from an 11 out of 10 to a 2. And I said, you are so brilliant. So all of a sudden I realized how much this is going to cost actually wasn't number one priority. They had the ability to put me at ease, to give me a sense of security, understanding, control, certainty, all of these things that were above and beyond my perceived idea that money is my main question. You tell me how much this is going to cost and that's how I choose who I'm going to work with. So it's understanding what people want from us, what's important. Like Michael Jordan, was it his skills or was it his ability to work as a team and have teammates and create an atmosphere. Like there's all these unseen things that make Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan, aside from just his ability to shoot hoops. I think that's probably a true statement with anyone. There are so many variables. And that's one of the things I really love about the book mindset is it puts your focus on the process Because if you really are in love with the process, the outcome becomes feedback. Mm. When the outcome becomes part of your identity and it defines you, Mm. that's the insidious nature of a fixed mindset. So I I just want to go over what these misunderstandings are because I know I brought them up. and (laughs) Some people are like, what are these big misconceptions? There's three Shut up, Tiff. Let Bobby tell them. No, it's just really fast. Misunderstanding number one, and this is in Carol Dweck's words, it's that people take what they like about themselves and call it a growth mindset. So Mm -hmm. if you're someone who is loving, well, you have a growth mindset. You're someone who's open-minded, well, that's a growth mindset. No, it's not. A growth mindset, again, deals with your belief in and commitment to learning and how that changes you in constructive ways over time. That is a growth mindset. Anything else, because I've heard speakers throw out, like when it comes to positivity, mm. well, you know, you want to be positive because you, you don't want to have a fixed mindset. I'm going, that has nothing to do with it. It's, and then misunderstanding number two, many people believe that a growth mindset is only about effort, especially praising effort. The process includes more than effort. The process we want them to appreciate hard work, trying new strategies, and seeking input from others. In all of our research on praise, 
we indeed praise the process, but we tie it into the outcome. That is learning, progress, or achievement. So you got to know what your outcome is, right? And, and that outcome can be internal or external. And, and I love trying new strategies here because sometimes it's about knowing when to quit. Mm. If I don't like playing basketball and the only reason why I play basketball is because my parents expected me to play basketball because dad played basketball, I'm never going to optimize my potential. Mm. And if, if basketball is a way for me to get approval and dad loves me when I play basketball and play it well, if I don't play basketball, he doesn't prove. Well, that, that cultivates and supports a fixed mindset as well. So sometimes it's like, you know what? I'm going to quit. So I'm not going to just stick with it no matter what. I'm going to quit that. And I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm really a hockey player. Misunderstanding, uh, which I mean, I'm not even Canadian. And anyway, moving on. Misunderstanding number three. A growth mindset equals telling kids, and I put I I would put an emphasis of people, they can do anything. Me and Hobbes talk about this a lot. There's something everybody can do. I think everybody has an innate talent, an area of intellect that is truly unique, that if they put in hard work and effort, they can grow it to something that's valuable, not only to themselves, but others. But telling people you can do anything, that is absolutely bullshit. You know, telling the kid with poor vision, you could be a fighter pilot. No, you probably cannot. So there's certain, and, and you know, isn't that great? You know, because because certain people are suited for things and, and that creates this, this integrated diversity. That's why we need different types of people with different areas of potential, different backgrounds, different thought processes, because the problems we're facing today, our society itself is becoming more complicated, arguably, than it ever has been in recorded human history. I don't know, maybe shit was like really complicated at Atlantis, but in recorded human history, this is arguably one of the most complex times we're living in. Complex times need diversity of thought. And that needs inclusion of diverse types of people. So I, I, I love that. So she writes, it broke my heart to learn that educators and coaches were blaming kids for having a fixed mindset. That's, well, you have a fixed mindset. Well, that's a fixed mindset right there. <laughs> we as educators must take seriously our responsibility to create growth mindset friendly environments. Oh, yes. It's, we are in the business of helping kids. I wrote, again, people. We're in the business of helping people thrive, not finding reasons why they can't. You don't get a growth mindset by proclamation. You move toward it by taking a journey. And I, I see way too many proclamations in a lot of quote unquote educators that they're not useful. They're not accurate. They lack context and no, they are not reflective of the mindset that you're accusing people of not having or encouraging other people to have. And you're demonstrating you don't have it yourself, which is okay, but be open to recognizing that and maybe offer people strategies on, well, how, how do I resolve this? How do I get what I want? If I can't take action, what might be some of the reasons other than I am weak and fucking lazy? Just convince somebody of that. And it's like, okay, now they're not learning. Mm. That's the last thing I want to do is convince you that some people, the rare few, the people buying my programs, you're amazing, right? Keep purchasing shit. And you have the right mindset, but other people are lazy, right? Who's these other people? Do I really want to convince them that they're lazy? Shouldn't that be the antithesis of what I'm trying to do? Because as an educator, aren't we trying to lift people up and engage them in a love of learning? Because I do believe learning is the key to a lock on anything, including happiness. We're miserable when, not, when we're not growing and learning. The last thing I want to do is convince you of the fact that you have a negative attribute. Mm. I like them. I get really stuck on the, um, not stuck on it, but I've I always have pushed back on that. Um, 
I guess two things. One is that idea of quitting and giving up. And I think that that always lacks context when people say it, you know, never give up or stop quitting things or stop, or stop. You know, I remember once raising it with Harps when he talked about, you know, don't keep coming to workshops. He would tell people, don't just keep coming to workshops and not doing the work. And I was like, hang on, you also, there's there's also value in within a workshop, immersing yourself in the intention, immersing yourself in the environment, immersing yourself in the messaging. And me- like whether or not you are executing all of the things that you would really like to see yourself doing, at least you're executing the beginning of them. At least you keep on showing up. And showing up, you know, it cha- you, you changed anyway. And yeah, you did. You're, you're, you're changing as a result. If you are learning something, your brain is changing, first of all. Second, that is a micro behavior. So we've talked about this, I think, on the podcast mm-hmm. within the research and the trans theoretical model of change. Booking something and showing up for an event is in itself a behavior and it does change the way you feel about yourself and how you start to define yourself. Now there are people who perpetually go to workshops and they don't throw themselves into action. So the workshops are a method of procrastination. Like if if you love going to workshops and you love the learning process, you love that social environment, by all means, um, I would never tell somebody what they should or shouldn't do. But there comes a point where if you're looking for an outcome, it does require getting into action. And Mm -hmm. all those workshops are preparatory. It it does help you become positioned to take act. But again, know what you want. Not the guy in the front of the room. Not me if I'm on stage. Know what you want from this. And be honest with yourself about whether or not you're getting it. Yes. (sighs) Yes. Somebody posted a long time ago. It doesn't matter. It, it, you know, it, what your intentions and your thinking and what you're learning doesn't matter. It matters what you do. It matters that you take action. And, and I posted a question. I said, is there, is there a scenario where intention and learning and thoughts inform consistent actions? And he writes, absolutely, always. Okay. Go back and look at your post then. (laughs) Yeah. It does matter. Your intentions inform your behaviors. Mm. So it doesn't matter what you intend to do. It matters what you do. No, those two things are inseparable. Why does everything have to be either this or that? Yeah. I say when you're in a workshop, be really attuned to what you're what your inner voice is saying, what you're saying to you in the middle of it. Cause I think a lot of people can, not a lot, some people, I wonder how many people sit in a workshop to negatively reinforce that they're not good enough, that sit there and the narrative mm. that's running under the s- surface level of their consciousness is actually, you don't do this, you don't do that. See all the things you're not doing. Now they're the people that are keep showing up and aren't making progress and it's, I mean that you've you've got to be attuned to that. That's not. I don't think people are rocking up deliberately saying that, but I think it's happening. That does happen. That does happen. I I I know people who were in the same community, and we all went to seminars. And I I went as a student. I went as an instructor, and people would sit in the audience, especially when you have one of these speakers up at the events that are telling you, like, it's almost like, it's almost like this evangelical experience. And they're, they're there to convict you of your sins of omission. They're like, yeah, that's right. That is me. I'm not doing enough. I'm not doing enough. And so now you're letting someone else's expectations of you who doesn't know you. This person doesn't even know you. You think you know them because they're on stage. They have no idea who you are. You're just, you're just one of the people in the seats. And now you're reinforcing a belief system that keeps you stuck based on what the guy on the stage is saying. We have to be very careful because mm-hmm. we have a fiduciary responsibility as presenters in terms of what we're saying and, and the impact that it has on people. Mm-hmm. Because half the room is like, yes, Absolutely. 
you know, you got to do this, 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 and those people, those people, but there are other people in the room. You make a really good point, Tiff, that are going, I am those people. Mm. Yeah, we all are, and we're all not. Hold on. Before, before you go ahead and use someone's statement as a personal identity and a life sentence, mm-hmm. just I think you need to ask yourself a few more questions. I'm sorry, what, what, but you were about to say something. Um, one of my friends last year, she, she read a book and got me to read it, and it was really interesting, and it's called Existential Kink, and it's a bit mm-hmm. weird, it's a bit kinky. Uh, but it's it's qu- actually quite interesting. And it, when I first I had to reread it, I kind of I read it and I was like, this is a bit bit kind of weird parts of it. But then I went back and I was like, I was almost off put by how some of it was framed at first, so I wasn't digesting it right. But as I read on, I was like, actually, a lot of this is in a different context and worded differently, but is actually and aligned with my belief system around it. And it was this idea of, so when you Google it, it says existential kink, unmask your shadow and embrace your power, a method of getting what you want by getting off on what you don't want. So the concept of it is that all of these things, like when we're attracting, we'll talk about it to people who are attracting the same situations again and again and again, that we say we don't want, I don't want this. Um, I don't want this type of guy in my life. And then we go out and every time we're attracting that type of guy or, or, the, or it's that type of job or that type of treatment from friends, whatever the situation is. And realizing that there's this, in inverted commas, shadow side of us, it, it's serving some sort of a purpose. So embracing and accepting what is it that I'm getting off on subconsciously? What is it that's resonating about this thing that on the outside is shit and it's causing me pain, but on some level, Obviously, it's serving some purpose. Um, it's reinforcing a belief. If I'm attracting people, people who always talk me down, was there a situation in my life or upbringing or growing where mm. I became the person that was talked down to? So that makes me feel connected or makes me feel like that is that's my identity. So then I feel I connect with that. But then on the surface, again, we're like, this is a shit. <laughs> this is shit. Or, or I could get into this situation with this person. I could change this situation. Yeah. And resolve some of those horrific experiences. Yeah. Which yes. you probably can't. Yeah. But that's a subconscious pattern that people get themselves yeah. into. But you're right, just as going through that introspective process is far more valuable than putting an immutable label on yourself. Mm. Mm. The self help oh, no wonder your podcast is called the self help antidote because when you start to really unpack some of these things, the danger is that most of us hear, everybody hears these surface level comments or and attached to something and we want, we just want that to be the answer. So we hear that and we don't dig any deeper or ask or be curious about what else could be at play. Self-help's a bloody sludge, isn't it? Like Not time. all of it. Not, not, you know, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine. She's, um, I'm not going to mention her name, but she's, she's a psychologist. So she's Dr. So and so. And <laughs> she is so discouraged with a lot of the messaging because she's like, it's so inaccurate. And it's such a misinterpretation. It's a contradiction of what the research is actually saying helps people. But people are, are so committed to it because it's said with such conviction and intensity. And it, it's hard to overcome, you know, a, a lot of her patients come in with these beliefs that they've adapted because they keep hearing the same messaging over and over from different people. And just because you're hearing something from a lot of different people and they agree on it does not mean it's right. Mm. It's just like, it, it is almost in direct contradiction of the research and it's not helping them. They're not happier. They're becoming progressively more miserable. Mm. So, and you know, this is someone who I, I think is fantastic. So there's this part of self-help that gets me angry because I think it's predatory. And it's just, it's not just to do that to people. But then there's this other aspect where I believe a lot of this messages come from people who truly believe it. They truly believe what they're saying. And then there's there's other types of self-help 
Like my wife just went through a old, a few day Tony Robbins event and she wanted to buy into this bigger, more involved program. And she's like, should I buy this Tony Robbins event? You know, he was, he was, he was like offering it during the last day. And first of all, I don't, I don't really think that's my decision. I wasn't at the event. You were second. No, I think a lot of Tony Robbins stuff is quite helpful, quite good. So there are people in that space that are sharing, but, but even Tony Robbins, right? E- even Tony Robbins, like when he gets interviewed, a lot of his stuff is so counter, where it's just like roll your sleeves up, discipline yourself, and do the work. And mm-hmm. you know, Tony Robbins is like, well, yeah, you know, you're not going to get anything by sitting around doing nothing. It requires massive action. But you're saying that there's not a mo- there's not an emotional reason. Like motivation, the whole reason why you're doing something doesn't matter. As I remember him having this conversation in an interview going, every decision you make is based on emotion. The fact that you get up and work 12, 15 hours a day and you build a business that most people would quit. You don't think there's intense emotional reasons behind that? It kind of helps when you discover what those are. So even his information is not, it it doesn't really fit with a lot of mainstream self-help. But but the the point I want to make is there are some people in that space that are doing an amazing job and they're really helping a lot of people. Then there are people in that space that help some people hurt others. And then I think there are people in that space that have a catastrophically negative effect. Like we talked about the no friends, get rid of your friends episode. Yeah. Well, the, guy, the, the guy who is saying that is, an ex- if, if you look at life from building a business and acquiring wealth, this guy's an absolute champion. Clearly knows what he's doing there. But when you take a look at how defragmented we are in, in our society, how lonely people are, loneliness is a higher risk factor than smoking. Yeah. When you take a look at the terrifying escalation in suicide rates, when you take a look at all the data on what does it mean and what makes people happy in the first place, his advice might really appeal to one, two percent of the population. But people are going, that guy's really successful and I need to think like he thinks and live like he lives. You're going to be fucking miserable. Mm -hmm. And And it might have even a deeper detrimental effect than misery. That is bad advice for the masses. I don't care how good you are in business. Yeah. I was trying to remember the name of the last book. Oh, Bronnie Ware. Bronnie Ware doesn't care either. (laughs) Bronnie Ware doesn't care. (laughs) That should be her next book. (laughs) See, but, but, but that's a book, right? It doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter (laughs) if you're struggling financially or you've built five super successful businesses. Every single person who comes to that book and opens it up, reads in between the covers of that book will get something for their life. They'll get insight. Mm. And I'm not saying that everything written should never do any harm. Sometimes people just say what they want to say and that's their opinion. And You need to discern, is this right for me or is this not right for me? You know, Because otherwise everyone has to watch what they say and then we're not thinking as a society. So you don't want to go too far in the other direction. But I can't imagine anybody reading Bronnie Ware's book and being injured by it and not having insight utilizing the vicarious experience of Bronnie and the patients that she talked about mm. to kind of conceptualize how that pertains to them in a, in a very personal way. Mm. That is a beautiful book. And do I agree with everything in the pages? No, thankfully. There were some things that she was saying, I'm not sure that really resonates with me. Mm. And that's great because that caused me to stop and go back. Yeah, I love that. I'm gonna have to read that book after we unpack. I haven't read it myself. No, it's it's it really it really is a good book. I just I just think I just think of uh, Nikki Morrison. 
I was like, I don't know if I should say her surname, but she was on Craig's podcast. Mm. Yeah. She's a palliative care nurse and she she's amazing. Like yeah. when when I first met her, I didn't know, like I didn't know what to make of her, quite honestly. Not saying that I was in any way put off. It's just it was the opposite. Very rarely do you you know how you meet oh God, I was listening to I was listening to a podcast where someone was saying they know someone who went on a date with Ted Bundy, speaking of my tasteless oh Ted my Bundy God. joke earlier. Yeah. <laughs> and she said, listen to this. She was sitting at the table and she was like 18. And he, she's convinced he didn't want to go on a date with her. He was grooming her. He, he, he wanted to hurt her. He wanted to kill her. Oh my God. Because she said when, she, when, when he became famous, well, infamous rather for all of those murders years later, she almost fell over realizing she went on a date with this guy oh. because like, he looks nothing like, like he was a very good looking guy. He was handsome, charming. He said, not when he is in a predatory mode, his wow. whole face is transfigured. And I just saw something across the table and I was like, get me out of here now. Something is seriously wrong here. Oh. She called her brother. She, she won't come out of the bathroom. She's like, come pick me up. So there's some people where, you just read something about them. You don't know why, but you better pay attention to it. Mm. Like in that case, yeah. Nikki Morrison was the opposite. Like I, I was like, I don't know what it is about this human being, but I can't put words to it. I can't describe it. And oh God, this is, I'm in the presence of something. So like really beautiful a level of empathy and concern for human beings that I don't understand. And I, I know all this is think, okay, he's lost his mind. He's day drinking again, isn't he? And I assure you, I'm not, but <laughs> you know, Har- Harps told me, he warned me. It's like, before you meet her, you have to understand she's very different. Like this wow. is the closest thing to an angel you'll ever meet. And I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm sure she's lovely. You know? And then she showed up and she sat down. So I was like, okay, wow. Like there, there are people. So, so as much as we're like, are people good or people, who knows? I think we're, 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 we have the potential to be all types of things, but there are people like that walking around and doesn't mm. that make life amazing? Mm. So true. My friend rain rain is like that rain. Shout out to you. She's amazing. She's a paramedic. And an angel. Anyway, speaking of paramedics, not a good segue. I've got to go. <laughs> well, that sounds ominous. Are you okay? Speaking of paramedics, I think I need to bring this episode <laughs> to an end. <laughs> See you maybe not next week. <laughs> oh, thanks, Everett. Yeah, hopefully I'll see you next week. They do a good job. Um, thanks, Bobby. Stay safe, Tiff. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Visit us at theselfhelpantidote.com to share your feedback, insights, and recommendations on what topics you'd like us to explore in the future.